everyone. My name is Ryan Cam, and welcome back to the 1999 Project. I've got one good movie I'm covering, and I've got a guest coming on to talk about that. And two, two kind of subpar movies. One sort of good, and the other one just genuinely awful. Let's just rip the band-aid off now. Let's talk about Love Stinks. I hate you more. You suck! You suck! Say goodnight, Gracie. She can't swim! <laughs> Whoop. Love Stinks. How hilarious. How highly, highly humorous. Love Stinks was directed by Jeff Franklin, and this is just an awful movie, you guys. It's like, it's really bad. It tells the story of a man and a woman named Seth and Chelsea, played by French Stewart and Bridget Wilson Sampras, respectively. One of them is a writer on a soap opera type of show, and the other is an interior decorator. The two end up starting a relationship, and it is about as smooth as a church parking lot. They end up breaking up, however, the breakup is not smooth, and so they basically try to cut each other off at the knees because they are both screwed up in the head. Get this poster, and you read this sort of, th this plot, you would automatically think to yourself, this has got to be a parody movie, right? Like, those guys that did Epic Movie and Disaster Movie, surely they're behind this. No, no, no. Unfortunately, unfortunately, they play this completely straight, and that's why this movie is so bad. I don't really want to waste too much time talking about this. This movie's horrid. Like, don't watch this ever. However, one thing I wanted to highlight was just how bad this movie was. To make the long story short, Chelsea has a cat. And so Seth tries to get revenge on her. It's in the tit-for-tat battle, it's his turn to tit. Kidnaps the cat, catnaps the cat, and almost throws the cat off of a bridge. No, I am not making that up. I have drunken some green tea, but that's about it. I am completely on the level with you. That is a thing that actually happened. The cat is strapped to a bungee cord, so nothing bad happens to the cat. But I'm sorry, I have no patience for a movie that, like, similar to that one frickin' David Spade movie I covered earlier in this project, where he just casually throws the dog into the bathroom. I'm not a pet guy. I have a cat who I love very much, but I'm not, I'm not a pet or an animal guy, like, falling over backwards for him. But I will not stand for animal abuse even implied ones or close calls. You just can't make me get behind that. I'm sorry. The movie's just just bad. There's a lot more reasons why this movie's bad, but honestly, I just can't be bothered to talk about it beyond that. The movie's horrid. Don't watch it for any reason whatsoever. But now let's get into an infinitely better movie and didn't really have to try hard to be better. It's Stigmata. Stigmata was directed by Rupert Wainwright, the director of such movies as Blank Check and the remake of The Fog, starring Tom Welling. Quite a range there. And the movie starred Patricia Arquette and Gabriel Byrne, among others. It tells the story of a young woman named Frankie, played by Arquette. She has no real religious beliefs in her life. But then she begins seeing visions of, well, religious things happening to her. And then, to top it all off, she ends up getting the stigmata. The, if, you're, if you've ever been to church, it's Jesus hanging on the cross with the nails in both of his wrists and his feet. She gets those wounds, which is known as the stigmata. This gets the attention of a Catholic priest and investigator, played by Gabriel Byrne, to try and figure out what all is going on. Credit where credit's due, the movie looks awesome, but it's one of those movies where it's unfortunately as wide as an ocean, but as deep as a puddle. This is not a bad movie by any means, but there is so much potential here that just kind of went by the wayside. The movie looks great. It's very obvious Rupert Wainwright has watched at least one John Woo movie in his life, but the movie does look very solid. I do appreciate the kind of 
the kind of grimy look the movie has. Patricia Arquette and Gabriel Byrne are both good in their respective roles, but they play a normal woman and just a normal priest. I feel like maybe if they spice things up with, a, with the narrative a little bit, it would have been a more memorable movie. There is a movie from the Hammer series of films from the late 60s called Dracula Has Risen from the Grave, where Dracula has to fight off a regular man named Paul. However, Paul is an atheist, and Paul cannot kill Dracula because he cannot say Domine Patre Fili Spiritus Sancti. He can't because he is an atheist and he doesn't believe. By the end, he does believe and is able to kill Dracula. But there is an arc there. I feel like maybe in Stigmata, if you have like Patricia Arquette be kind of a normal-ish atheist, and then have over the course of the film maybe believe or believe long enough to get the job done? I don't know, that could have been something. Some cool looking visuals and some shocking moments, including one in a subway. The movie's just kind of there, really. There is enough style for me to give this a good rating, but I feel like there was some meat left over on the bones of this. But now let's close things out by taking a look at one of the more underrated horror movies I've covered for this project, and I've got a very special guest to talk with me about that. It's Stir of Echoes. <laughs> Stir of Echoes was directed by David Kep, a pretty notable screenwriter. We'll get to some of his credits in a bit. And the movie starred Kevin Bacon, Catherine Erb, and Iana Douglas, among others. It tells the story of a family living their lives normally. The, ma the main father figure is played by Kevin Bacon. He does not believe in ghosts or pretty much anything that he can see. However, one night at a party, he is hypnotized, and suddenly he sees things that he cannot explain. And what he finds out is that, well, his son can see dead people, for lack of a better word. And so this movie acts as a bit of a puzzle of sorts. It's a mystery, if you will, of the father and the son trying to figure out what all is going on inside of their house. But to cover this movie with me, I have a first-time guest on. He is one half of the Notorious by Chance podcast. It's Russell Howell. Russell, how you doing? I thought, you know, 1990 was a great year of films. Man, there were so many from top to bottom. I mean, it could arguably be the best year in cinema history. Um, but yeah, wanted to get on. And yeah, Stir of Echoes. I'm, I'm really looking forward to talking about this. Yeah, um, Chance in the other half is Chance Ellison from the Schmo Down, and so I, th I think that's just phenomenal. And so, and so you guys, the show's on a bit of a hiatus, from what I understand, but you all are coming back. So uh, I'll put a link in the description so that when you all do come back, you all, or every one of my audience, will know where to find you guys. But uh, let's talk about Stir of Echoes really quick. I like to ask guests about older movies, about what their first experience with a movie was. So what was your first experience with Stir of Echoes? First experience, I remember not seeing this in the theaters, which is crazy because I saw a lot of the 1999 films in theaters. This was one that just kind of went under the radar. It was a September release um, and just kind of went under the radar. I remember seeing it years down the road. Um, but like how you and I were uh, conversating back and forth on Facebook Messenger, um, I really didn't remember a whole lot about it. So this is like almost like a first viewing. Um, and then when I watched it, I'm like, man, I remember bits and pieces of it, but I don't remember the whole entire puzzle of the film. So it was pretty much kind of like my first time watching the film because I didn't really remember too, too much about it. But It was directed by David Kep, and he is a notable screenwriter. His screenwriting credits include... Jurassic Park, one of my all-time favorites, Spider-Man, the original Sam Raimi one, Mission Impossible, the first one, uh, the uh, the remake of War of the Worlds from Steven Spielberg, Zathura, like he's it's it's a it's a who's who of like movies you may have heard of but ha maybe yeah. know a passing interest in but you would have no idea like oh David Kep wrote that and sure enough he did. But he also is a director, not only of Stir of Echoes, but also another Kevin Bacon film that came out a couple of years ago called You Should Have Left. But also he directed Secret Window, starring Johnny Depp and John Turturro, and Premium Rush, which is a very fun movie about Joseph Gordon-Levitt, oh, yeah. who's a bike courier. I love that movie yeah. so much, by the way. But that's, that's a very thing. underrated film. 
yeah, it's it's so much fun because it, it's like it's compact, it's tight. It's basically Joseph Gordon Levin on a bike and Michael Shannon is a cop and they're trying to like get at each other for a reason that is a bit of a spoiler. I won't get into it here. But as yeah. far as Stir of Echoes goes and a fresh rewatch for you, first time for me, I really enjoyed this movie more than I expected. Like I said, it's it's a horror mystery of sorts because at the heart of the movie, it's about Kevin Bacon's character, Tom, trying to figure out why he's seeing the things in his head and like, like him going from, I don't believe in anything ghosts related or any of that stuff to seeing things that he just cannot explain what they are and then just trying to piece together the puzzle that is in his head. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Um, it's once he gets hypnotized, we really see the character start to unravel. Um, he becomes really obsessive with what is going on. Um, you, you see his day-to-day -day interactions with like friends and neighbors and stuff like that is consumed by seeing these visions and seeing certain things and just being really paranoid. Um, this is a really good, solid Kevin Bacon performance. Um, this movie really kind of reminds me, and it gives you the vibes of that, like a Sixth Sense type vibe. Obviously, 1999, uh, you know, obviously another 1999 uh, blockbuster, but um, it really gets me that vibe just because the sun can see dead people. Obviously, kind of plays with the Sixth Sense. Um, but just in general, though, kids and like animals and, and, and stuff like that and pets uh, have that inept ability to be able to see ghosts and spirit you know spiritual beings and stuff like that um but this movie doesn't play like yeah everyone can say oh yeah it's like six Sense. it reminds me of six Sense. it's not it, it, it definitely isn't the same by any means um kind of what you said in your explanation there with the synopsis it's basically one of these ones where you have to what like why is him and his son seeing these visions like who is this female what happened like you're it's like a like a pretty much you're piecing the puzzle together as the movie goes on and i think that's what really makes this movie uh really just like click it's a very short film an hour and 35 minutes and i i feel like it, it it's a very tight film i don't think there's any uh, lag in it i completely agree with you on that the movie did not need to go beyond 95 minutes like it's it gets in it gets out it doesn't waste any time i love how you brought up the the sixth sense because i feel like it's a bit of a it's a bit of an easy target to say like it's about a little boy who can see dead people and also there's some scenes there's some scenes where they focus on the color red kind of similar yeah. to what Shyamalan did in the sixth sense so the similarities are definitely there however i would argue sixth sense is more of a ghost story it's about yeah. it's about Haley Joel Osment trying to piece together why why he has these abilities while stir of echoes like i said is about like them trying to figure out why these things are happening to them and recognizing that they're basically it's kind of similar to weird example it's kind of similar to poltergeist poltergeist yeah. the house there is built on troubled ground let's just say and so the yeah. house was home to a pretty notable tragedy that was swept under the rug so if this movie pulls from anything, it only pulls from pretty notably great things. And so it all just becomes a melting pot and it becomes a great thing in its own right. It's like the old saying goes, if you steal from one thing, it's plagiarism. And if you steal from multiple things, it's research. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's making it its own film. I'm not saying it's completely, you know, cut and paste six cents. Obviously, Six Sense, uh, no spoilers for the people that haven't seen it. If you haven't seen it, you guys are living under a rock. Um, yeah. To me, it's it's one of those films where that is your twist ending. This one isn't really a twist ending. There's more of, you know where we're going, but we just want resolution by the end of the film where you don't see, like I saw Six Sense in a theater when it came out. You weren't expecting that. This is one of the ones where it's straightforward. You know, you have this character, you have his son. They both have these abilities to see different visions and stuff like that and hear different visions. But we know where we're going with this, whereas Sixth Sense really was the uh, rug pulled out from underneath us type. You know what I mean? So like what you said, borrows from a different, uh, you know, a hodgepodge of different films like Poltergeist, like Sixth Sense. But it makes it its own. Um, I really feel like it stands alone. It's its, it's, it's original concept uh, enough but uh yeah 
This is actually based on a novel which was written by Richard Matheson, a pretty notable author. He's written books like I Am Legend, which has been adapted a couple times. Also, uh, also a movie called Button Button, which would become The Box. Also, a movie called Ste a book called Steel, which would become Real Steel. So Richard Matheson has long and lengthy liter had a long and lengthy literary career. It really comes down to the characters and how well that they're developed. And Kevin Bacon is really good in the movie. I feel like I feel like Kevin Bacon gets overlooked in certain cases. People think, oh, the guy from Footloose, and that's where yeah. the conversation ends. I, yeah. I, I don't know if you've watched X-Men First Class recently, but he was awesome in that movie as Sebastian Shaw. And he's yeah. great here. Like he's he plays like the normal guy like he's a family man he just wants to take care of his wife and son that's all that he wants and then it this is thrust upon him and when he this is thrust upon him he throws himself headfirst into it when he's trying to figure out where he's heard that song before he literally pulls out his cd collection and he's like where have i heard that song before so it's not like kevin bacon sleepwalking through the movie he throws himself headfirst into it like, he sells it on the idea of, I need to figure out why I'm seeing this. And I love the spirit of that. No, and I, I do, too. I, I think he is a solid actor. There's a lot of, like like you said, you know, oh, he's the uh, he's the one in, in Friday the 13th. You know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of Kevin Bacon films, though. Like, Hollow Man that came out in the early 2000s, I thought was a really good film with him and uh, Elizabeth Shue. Um he was also really good in uh, Death Sentence, which is almost kind of like a Death Wish type film. I believe uh, James Wan directed that film. I'm not 100% sure. I, I'm pretty sure he directed that film. It's almost like a Death Wish type film. It's a phenomenal uh, revenge type film. Like, you know, uh, his some of his family gets uh, murdered and he is pretty much taking the act of vengeance um, but he's a solid actor when need be. I mean, yeah, he has a lot of throwaway roles. Like you said, X-Men First Class, Sebastian Shaw. I think it was you know, really fantastic in that. It was really nice to see him kind of take something a little bit more serious in that, in that X-Men film. Um, he's a really good actor. I, I think, you know, there's just a lot of throwaway roles he has. But um, there's a reason why you can link this guy to literally every actor in Hollywood. Uh, they play the Kevin Bacon game. I know me and my buddies used to do that all the time. Like you had to link an actor within two or, or uh, three or four movies to Kevin Bacon. And I mean, he just in, he's in so much, but he's definitely not a, um, you know, just not a, uh, a horrible actor. I think he's good when he when when need be. Uh, and, and this film, like I said, Story of Echoes, I really think he, he does what, you know, the uh, director wants him to do. Um, he takes it seriously, like you said, goes through a CD collection, tries to figure out where did I recall the song at? Like, I'm, I'm trying to listen through it. And, you know, I'm trying to I, I have heard a song. He cares. Um, and it's something definitely that I think his character throughout the film is trying to do. Um, but yeah, Kevin Bacon definitely doesn't put in a, uh, a cheesy performance in this film at all, by any means. Yeah, you also have Kevin Dunn in the movie as well, and I won't spoil who he is it's actually quite a big spoiler but yeah. he's in the movies Shia LaBeouf's dad in the Transformers movies we'll ignore that for the sake of it but he is <laughs> he is the dad in that movie but he's good that's the point I'm trying to get at and the whole thing about the movie like we've been discussing is that it's a mystery it's a puzzle that is just the pieces of the puzzle are on the table they're just not arranged properly yet and things that don't make sense to you in the moment by the end they make all the sense in the world like probably this might be one of my favorite endings of any movie i've covered in the 99 project i will not spoil it because i we're both recommending you go and watch this for yourself oh for sure but the ending i did not really see coming necessarily but i was like all right they're they're ambling towards a point right and then sure enough it goes not to it's not exactly a dream sequence it's more like a um i don't know what to call it it's like a vision i'll call it a vision for lack of a better example but yeah. it worked and everything that was building up the song and all these other things that are built up throughout they just come together and it's really smooth in that way no i i completely agree um have you ever seen the movie what about bob I've been meaning to. I have not. I know Bill Murray is in it. 
Okay, so the the doctor, Dr. Leo Marvin, Richard Dreyfus's character, his daughter is actually Kevin Bacon's wife in his film, um, which was kind of funny because I was like, oh my gosh, she looks so familiar and she sounds so familiar. And sure enough, she was like a younger kid, obviously in 1991 with What About Bob, eight years prior, but it was kind of crazy. I still remembered and it was just, it was just a, a funny, uh, you know, just a funny call out. Wow, that, I mean... She's obviously changed her name to Catherine Erb, E R B E, yeah. which is which is interesting. I never would have picked. I would have never picked up on that. So that's a that's a good catch. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. But um, but I also um, I also like the performance from the son uh, Jake, and not just because we share names, but uh, but I thought the boy did a good job. Uh, Zachary David Cope, I did like him Catherine Herb did a great job as well really um the digging scene I don't know for some reason it kind of reminded me of Close Encounters of the Third Kind where ironically enough I think it's Richard Dreyfus who's in that yeah. movie it's been a minute yeah but R Richard Dreyfus is like going crazy and he's trying to figure out what these messages mean we're kind of talking about influences Call me crazy, but I think there's like a close encounters of the third kind going on here where it's like like he's getting these messages and he did, can't figure out why. And so it makes sense to no one else except for him. So I, yeah. I made that I made that connection. No, yeah, I completely agree with it. Yeah, it, it absolutely makes sense. I, I see the connection. Ironic that Richard Dreyfus is in Close Encounters and his daughter is in this movie. And it's eerily similar subject matter. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. But um I feel like the term underrated kind of gets thrown around unnecessarily in certain cases. I don't hear enough people talking about Stir of Echoes. So I'll go on the record in saying that this movie is underrated. At, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, I know. But I think that this is just this is just a really well done little horror movie. It's it starts out it starts out with Kevin Bacon's character like trying to figure things out and then like when the meat of the matter hits, it really hits hard. And so like we were talking about, it's compact, it's in a 90 minute box, like you don't really, it doesn't really waste too much time and everything makes sense, a good amount of sense by the end. I'm personally going to give this an amazing grade. Talk about like one of the sleeper hits of the 99 project. Didn't expect to love this as much as I did, but I did. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Obviously, you're going to have it completely overshadowed with Fight Club, with Matrix, with uh, American Beauty, Eyes Wide Shut, Sixth Sense, Green Mile, Magnolia, on and on. Talented Mr. Ripley. You can go on and on with like some really solid films. Um, this one is definitely one of those ones that obviously would be in your top 10, but would be like an honorable mention. Definitely a solid film, tight, um, great acting, a good story, uh, keeps your interest for the 95 minute runtime. I mean, there's really not much to dislike about this film. Um, I think from top to bottom, I think it's a pretty tight film. I think Kevin Bacon does a serviceable job in it. Um, the supporting actors are great. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I give it a rec you know, I, I give it a high recommendation too as uh, a 1999 film. Obviously, like I said, it's going to get lost in those big, huge, heavy hitters of the 99s, but uh, this one's definitely a serviceable film. I mean, I couldn't agree with you more about that last part because. 99 like and i've talked about it in other places but 99 in some cases has had duds but every movie year has it's had its big projects that just ultimately went nowhere 13th warrior i just reviewed that a couple of weeks ago or yeah. last week skewed no two weeks ago i i'm forgetting myself i'm becoming <laughs> useless after nine o'clock but uh, <laughs> but um two weeks ago 13th warrior it, it was it was kind of boring and forgettable but when people say like 99 had all of these big time movies that people are still talking about to this day like they're really not kidding and so i don't know what the greatest movie year debate is i think 99 belongs in the conversation now that i am over the halfway point and i'm approaching the three-quarter mark and i've still got Fight Club left to cover, The Straight Story, David Lynch's movie from this year, uh, Princess Mononoke, Bringing Out the Dead, and I'm just reading it off of my list. Yeah. So just 
loaded year with like gems large and small i guess we'll just leave it at that but uh what did you all think of any of the movies i've talked about let me know in the comments i'd love to read what you have to say uh russell thank you so much for joining me to talk about stir of echoes you will be back later on in this project absolutely and, uh, and uh like i said notorious by chance is going to be coming back very soon link in the description below uh can you give us a preview of what you and chance got coming up uh, yeah, we are going to be doing a 25th anniversary, go figure. Uh, 1999, again, I don't think we have to beat a dead horse. It's a fantastic year in cinema history. There's so many great films. Um, and we had a poll on Notorious by Chance on Facebook. If you guys haven't joined the Facebook group, because that's where we usually put the polls up for you guys to vote on what we do. And it was between Fight Club and Sixth Sense. Wasn't a shocker. But then uh, Fight Club ended up pulling away. So we're going to be talking about Fincher's uh masterpiece fight club this will be our third david fincher film we talked about seven we had dan merle on the uh episode with that um and the other episode we talked about uh fincher was um social network another fantastic film so uh looking forward to getting really down and dirty with the uh, fight club but we can't talk about it because that's the first rule um but yeah really looking forward to talking about this film and that's a crazy poll getting dan merle to uh talk about uh to talk about a Fincher film with you. That is insane. But um, yeah. the Facebook page and the YouTube channel are going to be linked in the description. Go give these guys a subscribe and join the Facebook group. I am a part of the group. And so, uh, so be on the lookout for that. But as far as this channel goes, the 99 Project will be continuing on next week by taking a look at at least, at the very least, three movies. I'm covering the Martin Lawrence film Blue Streak, Sam Raimi's baseball movie for the love of the game and and the Tommy Lee Jones led movie with Ashley Judd called Double Jeopardy but uh for Russell my name is Ryan Cam we will see you all in the next one take care